Okay, well, great to see everybody. We are starting the Gospel of John this morning. Been looking forward to this. Also, uh, as I told some other folks, been fairly intimidated. This is a uh, letter that has been looked at a lot of different directions by a lot of different folks, and uh, there's just uh, a lot of good teachings on it. Of course, you do your own study, and then I looked at commentaries, and I wanted to share one. There's so much material, and we were in a bookstore, Half Price Books, and I saw, oh, there's a commentary on John, and it's just a phone book, and I go, <laughs> are you kidding me? And I picked it up, and the reason I'm sharing this, this it was volume one of three, just on John, so... uh we will not be going quite that much in depth. So, so let's see. Zoom, folks. This is still fairly new for me with you all, so I don't mean to ignore you if I do. Just wave, throw something at me or, or whatever. Uh, jump in anytime. Uh, we're going to teach. We're going to go through this class. Uh, Doc's going to help as he can. He's had a wild schedule lately, but he's going to jump in there. So, I always look forward to him sharing thoughts. Um, through April 3rd, which, as someone, Danny, pointed out that I hadn't even thought about, ends very appropriately with the Ascension and Easter's the next weekend, so that's kind of kind of cool. And then uh, in April through May, Scott's going to lead us in the class on the law, and he'll be speaking of what that means to us today and to Gentiles and today. Then this summer, we may be, we're, it's not set yet, but we may be looking at more Psalms. Oh, stay in one place. Oh, okay. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about schedule later. But anyway, through uh, April, May, and then we'll be continuing with kind of our theme on trust and classes uh, through the rest of the year. So why John? Why the Gospel of John in relationship to our theme? Well, those of you who remember uh, Danny's teaching on pisteo, pursuo, uh, the class for or the word Greek word for belief or trust or faith, either way, is used about a hundred times in John. So it just kind of comes to mind automatically. And so <clears throat> I thought, well, that was neat. We've got to look at that. And then the more I dug in, the more I realized I didn't know John. And uh, I don't know about you, but I have a tendency, even though I may read a whole a whole letter or book, but there's just certain passages that stay with my mind. And so when I think of that letter, I think of certain passages. And so I'm thinking, oh, yeah, that has so many neat this, this, and this, and I forgot there's all this deep stuff, which we'll talk a little bit about. The plan is, uh, I, I really like JJ's uh, format with the way you handle Deuteronomy. And so we're going to cover, uh, try to cover about two chapters a week. There may be a week we do one or three, but two chapters a week. John has 21 chapters. And so uh, my plan is, and this may evolve, is to do a summary and go through kind of the major points and then come back to maybe a couple things or maybe to a theme and have more discussion. So we won't be going through verse by verse, except in certain areas. Uh, the key points may not be what the guy with the three volumes has, it, it, or, or the the people who know a lot more than me. It would be ones that kind of stand out to me. So one thing is I one thing I want to mention, and I hope hope to remember it uh, throughout, or at least I hope you remember. Anytime you have a thought or a question, or you just hey, can we stop and talk about such and such, or you, you didn't mention this thing that's kind of the key to all, all of John. Uh, uh, I probably missed it. So be sure to speak up and say something. And of course, we're trying to use the mic uh, for those of us in class and those of you on Zoom, just raise your hand. Today, what I hope to do is to do a quick background. And I mean, these will be very brief and uh, mention an outline or two and then uh, talk about the uniqueness of John, which I knew it was unique, but I didn't realize how unique until I started spending some time on it. Then we'll do a quick just mention of some themes that I've noticed, and then we'll cover chapter one and two. So you, as you can see, today's pretty packed, and some of this I'll cover real quick. And uh, 
if we don't make it through everything, we'll, we'll continue it into chapters three and four next week, but we will finish through four next week. So uh, you already know it's one of the four gospels. The author never, it never says it's John, but it's the tr tradition is it's John the, the apostle. Uh, he's referred to mostly as the disciple whom Jesus loved throughout, throughout the letter. Uh, there's many different thoughts on the, like everything. There's many th different thoughts on the dates and the timing, uh, all the way from the late 60s through the 90s. And uh, kind of the, the general point of agreement is it was written last, probably 10 to 15 years later after the other letters. And so I don't know if that's the reason for the different focus or just the different focus uh, and then the approach to it. But the main point that most go to is the verse in chapter 20, 31 that kind of wraps up that first conclusion. Uh, this was written that you may believe. And with our theme, that you may trust and build trust. One of the, now I know I've been focusing on this for a couple months. So I know when you walk in cold turkey on a class, I, well, I don't know, some of you have just unbelievable memories, especially in regards to scripture. But uh, for me, if it was, you know, I walk into a class and, and I may remember three verses of a letter that, I mean, if I just think right off the top of my head, <clears throat> much less an outline. But the most common outline goes, uh, there's, a, there's a prologue or an introduction in the first 18 verses, which we'll spend some time on. Then the next, through chapter 12, are little excerpts of Jesus' ministry. And then there's nine chapters on the last week, really more than that, uh, because it actually starts at about chapter 10. <clears throat> really almost, almost uh, or about around a half of John deals with Jesus' last week and then the resurrection and his appearances which that's someone unique by itself. The, uh, the section with the uh, ministry, uh, I noticed a lot of commentaries call this the book of signs because it has to do with a lot of his miracles. And then the, the other half is the book of glory because it's talking about his glory revealed. Uh, when you look at his ministry, and I've never done this with the gospel, maybe they're all similar this way, but uh, someone went through and, this probably deals with just 20, 30 days in Jesus' ministry, probably less than that in terms of specific instances. Uh, all four Gospels, of course, have the same story, but John has some huge differences. Um, and that's why when you talk about the synoptic gospel, Gospels, which uh, I was never an expert on, but some of you had classes on that, yeah, that usually almost always refers to just the first three Gospels because they're so similar in format and approach. Uh, John is missing a large number of key stories from the other Gospels. For instance, we just finished celebrating Christmas, the birth of Jesus, talking about Mary, the angel coming to Mary, Joseph. None of that's in John. There's nothing about his birth. There's nothing about Joseph and Mary. Well, there is about Mary later, but not about the birth and the angel. There's nothing about Jesus Baptism, his temptation in the wilderness, his agony in Gethsemane in the garden. Uh, there's nothing about John the Baptist as. Uh, there's none of Jesus' parables. Some people make a case, maybe one or two things might be considered a parable, but none of the ones that we always go to, they're not in John. Uh, the details of the Last Supper, is, is this not there in John? It's kind of interesting. Then there's a whole bunch of material that's in John that we think, think of all the time, or at least I do, think of all the time when you think of the Gospels, you think of Jesus, and that are only in John, the seven I am statements. And I'm going to rephrase that a little bit, the seven I am metaphors, because actually there's more than seven I am's in John. And so uh, for the numerologist here, you, Danny, uh, I found it interesting in John. I mean, there's no question numerology was very, or is very important in Jews. And it's God uses it in many ways in scripture. There's no question. In John, I found it interesting because you could see this taken to the extreme in different viewpoints about John, like the seven I am's. And then another person would say, and the seven signs. And the next person would say, and the seven feasts. And the seven 
uh, witnesses and the seven testimonies. And depending on your how you read it, all of those, there's more or less, every single one of them. There are seven signs, but if you read different commentaries, they disagree which signs. Well, we don't count this sign, this miracle, because it's really not, you know. And this miracle, and the ascension, we don't count as a miracle. It's considered the culmination, or, or anyway, there's different thoughts on that. But they, it is a useful, but there really are seven metaphors for the IMs, which is interesting, and they're, and they're pretty powerful. Um, but they are useful in terms of framing and remembering, you know, a lot of, a lot of things that we do uh, to, to remember. Um, I'm mainly going to mention the metaphors and the signs. One thing that's pretty unique, and I'd never thought about it, is John centers a lot on Jerusalem and, and the feast. Uh, most of the Gospels refer to the Passover only the last week of Jesus. John refers to three different Passovers and events around those. He also refers to, refers to other feasts that Jesus, and he'll, he'll do this as an intro, like they were going to the Feast of Tabernacles, and then this session happens. And uh, very interesting that he spends so much time. There's a lot of connections to Moses, the Exodus. Uh, long, another unique thing to John, uh, not exclusive to John, but just the amount of long discussions by Jesus or discourses. Uh, matter of fact, chapters 13 through 17 are strictly, it's strictly Jesus sharing thoughts. And there's a whole lot of chapters where it's 75 to 90% Jesus sharing uh, thoughts about who he is and, re and revealing who the Father is. Uh, many incidents that I think of thought a lot. I just never realized some of them that were only in John. Nicodemus is only in John. There's a Samaritan woman in Samaritan town. Washing feet is only in John. Even though we don't have the description of the communion, but we have the description of what we call communion, but we don't have description. We do have the description of washing feet. Uh, Thomas at the, at the end revealing, uh, touch my wounds. That, that, uh, incident. Meeting with Peter at the very, at the, after the resurrection, do you love me? That's only in John. So, uh, Karen mentioned in class, there were a lot of, we discussed this a couple of weeks ago in class, there were a lot of great comments. I'll be coming back to some of them uh, as we go through the course, but uh, the great, inter, what's called the great intercessory prayer in, in chapter 17, Jesus' prayer for his disciples. Uh, Catholics call this the the prayer of the hour of Jesus. Anyway, there, there's a lot of folks that really focus in on the, on the importance of this prayer. Uh, the use of uh, metaphorical and symbolic language. A, a lot of this is in John. Not saying the others don't have it, but it's really prevalent in John. Uh, again, the seven I am's, I'm the bread, the life, the gate, the good shepherd, etc. cetera. Uh, he describes himself as living water, uh, this temple. There's a, just a lot of language like that. Let's see here. Themes. Good. Themes. There are so many good themes, but um, what my thinking is, uh, there's deserves to spend some time on, on kind of each of these, or I'd like to, but I'd also like not to put more into this particular class than, than we already have. So what my thought is, is I'm going to mention these themes now and then during, as we go into other classes where they may come up in that particular, those chapters, uh, then we may come back and spend a little more time on them. So one of the course belief, trust, and with it, one thing that I'd like to focus on that area is the idea of growing trust or the evolution of trust. Uh, Lawrence talked about the anatomy of trust, and <clears throat> I think John is just full of segments that illustrate the growth of trust. Or somebody mentioned a few weeks ago, I think, uh, I don't remember what class it was in. Maybe it was your first class. Somebody said, trust is not static. I, I, I really like that word, that it's not static. <laughs> We're going to see this throughout John, how trust moves and grows in the people that follow him. And sometimes is a little shaky. So we'll, we'll be coming back to that quite a bit. J Jesus' identity, that's a major theme as we see right off the bat. 
Uh, one commentator I thought expressed this well. It, it, he said, uh, first three gospels tend to focus more on what Jesus taught and did, where John focuses more on who Jesus is. Now that's not an absolute, but I think we'll, we'll see generally. And, and John looks at his identity from many, many angles. The prologue, which we'll talk about, the long discourses where Jesus is describing himself. And uh, most of these are not teachings on, like I said, parables, for instance, but he, it seems like he always leads it back to who he is in relationship to the Father, who the Father is. And so uh, they're, they're really interesting. Uh, there's, there are a lot of testimonies or witnesses who throughout that Jesus is the Son of God, including from God himself. Uh, another technique that John uses is, is Jesus corrects misunderstandings, and you'll see this numerous times where somebody says, you know, I believe this. Well, if you believe this, <laughs> is that the reason you believe? Well, then wait till you see this. Or, you know, he'll, he'll correct them. Uh, and then the relationship with the Father, which I've mentioned a, new, uh, a bunch of times already, we will come back to that because that is prevalent. When I first started really digging into John, I kept coming to Carolyn. I'm not sure how to deal with this because he talks so much about the father that from a, I'm thinking of the practical logistics, not the deep stuff. I feel like I'm going to be so repetitive. You know, it's just, he just keeps teaching over and over, hammering it over and over and over the father, from the father, of the father, to the father, you know, because of the father, the authority, authority of the father. And as I was going through that, I noticed something, and maybe uh, won't take time on this now, but if, if some of you have some ideas on this thought, let me know later, and we'll try to work it into the class we talked about that. I couldn't help but notice the phrase, the Father. Most other places, and, and almost exclusively in the other Gospels, it's my Father, our Father. In John, he uses those. But over 60 times, he says, the Father. Very specific. And it's in the Greek, the Father. It's not just that it was interpreted that way. I haven't found so far anybody that really talks about this, about the significance. Now, probably it's all over. Next week, I'll find it all over the place. But so far, I haven't, haven't found it. Uh, and I think that's, there's a reason, reason for that. And I'm not sure I understand it totally, but I think that there are even partially, but I think there's got to be a reason for that. Another theme uh, is our time, like our has, my hour has not come. We'll see that over and over. Eternal life. Uh, the other gospels, while there may be a mention of this, usually it's in relationship to one story. Let's see if I can find it here. Oh, the rich man who comes. What must I do to inherit? eternal life. That phrase is there. Usually the, uh, Jesus or the, the author talks about, or the letter talks about the kingdom of God is one way. And John, he uses eternal life quite often, that phrase. Just, again, I'm not sure whether these are stylistic. You know, God allows different people to use their voice, you know, their, and, and you get your personality in there. But just things that, like the little rabbit trails, you go, does this really means something more than what I think it means. So John 1, 18. Oops, I missed something. I sure did. I want to come back to. Was it on page one? I sure did. Okay, just real quick. When I mentioned the outline, uh, I just wanted to mention from a geographical perspective, because I think it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, can you put the map up? Is it still a slide? I've got a handout here if anybody sees it, but just to save time. Most of you have studied quite a bit, and you know these areas, but the upper area is Galilee, and the lower area is Judea on the left. From chapter 2 through 7, Jesus goes back and forth three times. And then the entire rest of John is around Jerusalem and Judea. Like I mentioned, it's very, very, very different than the other Gospels. 
the other gospels, while there may be a trip to Jerusalem, it's really not the main focus till the very last week. So I think just without spending too much time on this, I, I think it's kind of, uh, it may be just another way that John reinforces how close Jesus is to the Father. That all of these discussions and the events, almost all of them, revolve around Jerusalem and the temple. So it's uh, just, I don't know if that's the reason, but I wanted to mention that. So let's see, here we got theme. Okay, John 1. We've got about 15, 20 minutes left. So now all we have to do is cover two chapters in 15 minutes. No problem. And then, I, of course, I have a couple of stories to tell in here. And uh, let's see here. The word. And as you know, as you most of you know this verse, in the beginning was the word. And logos... The, the Greek word for word. Uh, at first, I just wanted to write this off and not say anything because basically logos, if you look it up, I like to look up where words are used even if I don't know the total meaning. Logos is used all over hundreds and hundreds of times, you know, and it simply means verbal communications. I mean, it can be a passage that says this is a difficult saying. Uh, the news about them spread. If you have any word of encouragement or exhortation, that's logos or logos, depending on how you would say it. Uh, thinking about it more and doing a little more research. The, yes, it was a very common ordinary word, but it was a word also in another, from another perspective, very deep and, and uh, broad in its meaning. Uh, there's a whole, you can do a study sometime on what the philosophers thought at the time. That's not my area of expertise, so I'm going to just skip over that. But the, it's not hard to imagine what this word meant to Jews. And the same word is used when they translate the Old Testament, where it says word. They'll usually use, use logos in the Greek. Uh, but God spoke in the beginning in each of the seven days. As in God said... Uh, a psalm says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made through speech, through the word. So to Jews, I mean, that's, that's a powerful, maybe an ordinary word, but it's also a powerful word. Uh, the Ten Commandments, that now most of us don't use that phrase as much, or we just not use as much anymore. The ten, it means ten saying or the sayings or the ten words, actually. So pray power. Thus says the Lord. That's that's hundreds of times in the Old Testament. And so in this context, you, I mean, while God is using, John is using a very ordinary word, he's also using a word that is really rich in meaning too, that can be taken taken a lot of ways. Um, you've been listening to me for a while. So I'm going to share, I did find uh, someone who has, on, on this idea of the word, someone who has a pretty different interpretation so, Jen, would you, could you share that? I could go on for a while without this. You know, Danny and I were talking about how you have these epiphanies the morning before you're going to do a class or he does a sermon. So it's really hard to prepare too much in advance. 5.30 in the morning. The word. The word is the word. Okay. And Carol and I laughed. And laughed. Anyway. And I don't think there's anywhere, any way that the rest of this series doesn't go downhill. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'll just show that. Okay. The dance. Now that was from 1963 before my era, but isn't that, wasn't that, is that when you were born, Danny? Oh, 63. So I was going to say things went downhill, but things went uphill after that. Uh, those were major revelations. <clears throat> anyway, so I have all this material and I had to waste two minutes on that, but it was just so good. So it, it just, some things just have to be done. Okay, the passage. <laughs> yeah, you can never unsee that. There's probably a few of you 
probably crazier church pricers that probably dance at at some point. I don't know. I'm not a dancer. But, but the bird thing, anyway. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole passage. You heard it. I, the uh, Danny had a really excellent summary of it on December 25th in Table Talk. If you want to look at the tape, uh, very good summary. Uh, there's just again lots of deep studies on this. Some people refer to the chiastic st structure. I'm not going to go there. That it was an early hymn. Uh, there's kind of back and forth thoughts about that. Uh, of course, there's all kinds of thoughts about the the Trinity. And as you can tell by the video, I, I'm not that deep, so I'm not going to go into any of those. I prefer the shallow end of the pool. But we'll, uh, but the entire section of this 18, if, you, if you're looking at it now, where he talks about it, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and it goes on and it just builds and builds, is uh, time is very important in John. But he starts with a section that's kind of outside of time. It's like in the beginning, which has to evoke memories of Genesis. It just has to, I would think. Um, Lawrence, you have a... Probably not in English. But uh, it, it, when he first spoke, or the, the first record of God speaking is when everything started. Great, great point. For those on Zoomers, if you didn't hear the first part of that, that it references, uh, Lauren said when it, that it references or speaks back to you that God spoke creation into existence. And then John starts here with, uh, in the beginning was a word. Oh, we could spend so much time, but you can see the build up here. Beginning was the word, it was God. All things were made through him, and him was life. He was the light. Then he brings in John the Baptist. John bore witness of the light. Uh, all, of his, all who received the light, he allowed to become children of God, uh, not born of flesh, but God. And, then the, and the word itself became flesh. We've seen his glory and his grace. And grace of tr and truth have come through Jesus the Christ. Just another little side note. I think it's interesting as you build through this whole thing, if you imagine listening to this, if you didn't know, if this is your first time hearing, hearing or reading the gospel, Jesus is not mentioned until verse 17. It's kind of, I just thought that was just this, with the idea of this is just huge buildup. And Jesus, and I'm going to say is the Christ, because I think that's a little more accurate when we refer to Christ. Um, so it's hard not to think of Genesis. One, another side note, those of you saw a movie, this so-so Noah in 2014, there's a scene in there that I, that I remembered that I, it just always stuck with me, knowing Noah sharing with his family and it's kind of dire, dire times. It's bad times. And he, sh he shares with his family around campfire, the creation story. And there's a video in that that everybody made a big deal because it kind of, hinted at evolution, but that's always kind of stuck with me because you think of the oral tradition passing down history and narratives that <clears throat> how comforting that must have been to hear that story in hard times throughout, throughout the ages, in the beginning. And I can imagine there's a little bit of that with John's, all through John's letter, but in particular these 18. And not only was it a powerful statement, it's an encouraging statement. They, can you imagine you're going through persecution, you're going through whatever, if, if you're a Jewish Christian, it's still, it's got to be unsettling, even though maybe even don't, whether you go or when or not to Jerusalem anymore, the idea that the, the temple had been destroyed and Jerusalem had been destroyed. Yeah, and then now you're being persecuted as a Christian, all these different things happening at the time. And then you hear, in the beginning was the word. And I, I think that could apply to us in difficult times to just stop and think. Or if you can imagine somebody reading those words when we're going through dark times. In the beginning was the word. So it's a word, word of comfort to me too. Um, let's see. 
I think that's all we're going to say about that. We're going to fly through a lot of the rest of this because I do want to try one more part. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm going to break this into little transitions that you'll notice I've highlighted. Uh, and this is the testimony of John. I, I bolded that. Not highlighted, but bolded. Down in 19. So we just have a quick reference to the, the Jews send priests and Levites to question John. And we, we will mention this again too, but this is the first reference in John uses a uses a term called the Jews. Bless you. Bless you. And uh, it's kind of a vague term. You really don't know exactly what he means. A lot, a lot of times in scripture, when Jesus is being challenged just by the Pharisees, by the Sanhedrin, uh, the Jews sent, sent a group uh, to question John about who he is. And he says, I'm not the Christ. They asked him about that. I'm not Elijah. I'm not the prophet, but I'm the one who is a voice speaking out of the wilderness about the coming Messiah from, from Isaiah. And then in 29 to 34, again, we have another one, another one of these little transitions. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him. John did. And so he's testified about who he is. And now he's testifying about who Jesus is. And he says, behold, the Lamb of God, I saw the Spirit descend on him, and it remained on him. And in 33, uh, John says, I baptized with water, but the, he who sent me said, he whom the, so whoever sent John, and I think pretty clear he's referring to God. <clears throat> uh, he whom sent this, he who this, I'll try it again. He whom the spirit descends and remains shall baptize with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, bear, I bear witness that Jesus is the son of God. And notice how specific it is. And we won't chase this, but there's a, probably a whole sermon in the idea of, I saw the spirit descend on him and it remained on him. It says it twice as an identifier who Jesus is. In 35, the next day, again, John and disciples were together. And this is where the first two disciples that we have record of. There's two disciples that are following John, and he tells them, behold, the Lamb of God. And so they follow Jesus. And one of those disciples, Andrew, goes to get his brother Simon and tells him we found the Messiah. And Peter follows, follows him, and Jesus renames him Cephas or Peter. Then we go down to... Can I get out of order again? Oh, excuse me. Um, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and spend a, lot, a little time on the, on the wedding at Cana. That's 2, 1 through 11. And uh, on the third day, there was a wedding. So see, you just see how John shifts locations a lot of times by, uh, by just using a time reference. Now, most of you know the story really well. There's a wedding. Jesus and disciples and Mary were there. They are running out of wine. Mary comes to Jesus and tells him to take care of it. And Jesus turns water into wine. And uh, the disciples believe after they see this miracle. <clears throat> Just for some fun, and I'll ask you, or fun to me, okay. I don't have another video, so I can't compete. But uh, I was thinking about this and uh, just the characters trying to put yourself in a place. And I'm thinking, okay, Mary's asking Jesus to fix the wine. Well, in my mind, if you're, if you're at a big event like that, there's always a few people. You know, Jim, who's running around taking care of all the details, make sure everything's perfect. And we find out there's not something. Well, what do we do? We usually don't handle it ourselves, which would be nice if we did sometimes. I'm sure Jen would appreciate. We go, Jen. So in my mind, Mary's kind of the wedding planner. So she's running around and she's doing whatever needs to be done. She, see, she sees her running out of wine. However, this happened. This is conjecture. She comes to Jesus, and here's Jesus. And he's in his full-blown, out-of-the-art pictures we've seen, or the movies of the 30s and 40s. He's standing very rigid, and his hands are together. And he looks almost like he's hovering, and there's a little halo around him. And she says, you know, to do this. And he says, woman, doesn't thou knowest? It's not mine. Anyway. And so she tells him, tells the servants just to take care of it. Or it's Jesus that we see from some of the new, new interpretations where he's kind of the hippie Jesus and he's happy and he's got lots of friends and he's partying with his friend buddies, you know, and everything. And she comes to him and he says, well, and then the Greek, I think it says, mom, 
I just really don't. Anyway, I'm busy with my friends. You know, I don't think it's quite that way. It's probably either of those. But notice Mary never tells him, I want you to do this miracle. He just says, where is it? They have no wine. And she just tells us, that's all she says to Jesus. She tells the servants next to him, do, do whatever he tells you to do. And Jesus says, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not come. <clears throat> so I let me get my story, my pages straight. I thought about this, Danny and I were talking about it. This is not, this can't be Mary's first rodeo with Jesus. I mean, she remember that we just we just had all these neat lessons about Jesus and the angel. And I mean, Jesus knows, I mean, Mary knows who Jesus is. More than like, I mean, he's supposedly around 30 years old. More than likely, he's done a few things. That she's starting to know or she knows his power and who he is. Uh and she's in awe. I mean, it's just hard to even imagine being the parent, being the mother of, you know, this person is the Messiah, the Son of God. On the other hand, Jesus knows who Mary is. By this time, you can tell Jesus is, and I don't know any other phrase, I'll just say self-aware. I mean, he's, he's doing things that shows he knows he's the Son of God. Uh, when he calls... Uh, Uh, this I knew this was going to happen when I started co covering passages like this. I skipped one with calling on Nathaniel. When he calls Nathaniel, one of the disciples, he sees him somehow. You don't get the impression that he walked by and saw him. That he visualized Nathaniel sitting under a fig tree, and that's why Nathaniel said the fact that Jesus saw him from just knew who he was and knew where he was at. Uh, he must be the Son of God. So Jesus knows who Mary is, and, and I, I had never really thought about it this way, but I know God and, uh, honored Mary, the angels honored, honored Mary. I hadn't quite thought about Jesus. I, I knew he honored her as his mother, but I hadn't thought about him as God, his, the aspect of him as, as God, how much he honored Mary he must have, and the trust that she had in God, and the faith that she had. And so I can just envision more of this scenario where Mary comes to him and says, we're out of wine. And he, he says, it's not my time. And she says, just in service, do it. And she kind of looks at him and smiles, or maybe even winks. Because they know, they speak the same language. And he looks back at her, and he doesn't, what changes my perspective on this, instead of it, Jesus reluctantly giving in because he's honoring his mother, and he's changing his purpose. It's not his hour. He probably, I'm just guessing, he probably looks at Mary and smiles right back. Says, this is Mary. But you, you know, of course I'm going to do it. I mean, it, I don't know if that means it. I just thought it kind of changed my perspective. And I thought I was being so original. And then Danny told me, the, told me in the new series, The Chosen, they do it that way. So it shows you what I know. But we are going to stop there. Uh, Sorry we didn't have much time for a discussion today, but we will pick up with mid-chapter two and then do three and four next week, and we won't have all this introductory stuff. So I hope that you'll jump in and, and give me your thoughts. So thank you.